with us this morning. And we're going to go right into our message for today. And so if you have a Bible, please open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you do not, please raise your hand and our Bible thumpers will be happy to come, bring you a Bible, and please open it up to 1 Corinthians 13. It should be marked for you. We're going to look at one verse today as we end our series on love. And today I want you to open up that passage, and today we're going to talk about valor, love's courage in the face of discouragement, and love's courage in the face of our world. I'm going to switch mics here now, Lander. <laughs> so when I first got into ministry, a very wise individual named Bob Fetters said Dave of course I said what he said um, one of the keys to ministry is being willing to go with the flow so no matter what happens in a service no matter what happens in a ministry or a project or a program be ready to go with whatever the Bible even tells us in Timothy that we're to be ready in season and out of season to give and provide the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And you know, sometimes technology just doesn't work for us. But you know what? It's okay because we know Christ always works for us. Amen? He also works in us. And that's what we've been talking about for the past three weeks, this being week number four of our series. And three weeks ago, we began to talk about the effect of God's love at work in our lives and into others. And we discovered in the first week that God's love adds value to the things we say, to the thoughts that we think, and to the actions that we display in our world. If God's love is at work in us, if God's love is working through us, then we will always find a positive reciprocation of, of, of our interactions with others. But when God's love is absent, when God's love is not with us, then the words we say, the thoughts that we think, and the actions that we perform according to Paul mean nothing because there's nothing to them. It's just an act. It's just something we do. But when God's love is within us, things we say, the thoughts we think, and the actions that we take all give and provide a positive response to others. Two weeks ago, we talked about the virtues of love, and that is this, adding God's love in our life provides goodness in the things that we say, goodness in the thoughts that we think, and goodness in our actions to others. So by you and virtue, according to 1 Corinthians 13, they work hand in hand for the purpose of providing what we talked about last week as victorious living or being victorious in our loves, being victorious in our relationship, being victorious in our friendships, finding victory over this world and finding victory over the problems that we face each and every day facing our world I wonder what our world would look like today if we understood God's purpose and how God is actively at work in our life and wants to work in our life and the things that we say and the things we do and the things that we think I mean I, I gotta tell you something I don't know about you you hear me say this all the time but I, I am just my head is getting ready to explode with the news of this week we have lost all sense of humanity. We have lost all sense of what it means to love one another, what it means to protect one another, what it means to be there for one another. Go ahead and just put that on, hey, back media, just go ahead and put that on 1 Corinthians for me when you get a chance here so everybody knows where I'm at. That way I don't get lost because I'll get lost. If I don't look up here and see something, I get lost. Now look at everybody's going, oh, I didn't know there was anything up there. Ignore the man behind the curtain. Today our system's acting like it's from Oz. 
that's for sure, from another land, another place. So we talk about value, virtues, victorious living, and then we come to the final one. And often I wonder why Paul set it up like this. Values, say, think, and do. Goodness in what we say, think, and do to provide victorious love or victorious living for all. And then into the final one, valor, the courage. The courage to live a life of love to others. And it takes courage today, gang. I mean, anybody would tell me that it doesn't take courage to love one another, to love others, or as Matthew told us, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and your neighbor's as yourself. I defy anyone to tell me that that's easy. I defy anyone to tell me that that's possible without the love of God at work within us. See, what's going on here in Corinthians, if you're going to understand chapter 13, it's really important that we understand the chapter that comes before that. And that is in chapter 12. In chapter 13, we find that Paul is responding to the spiritual gifts that God has bestowed on us for the purpose of being Christ-like to our world and showing others the way to eternal life. And so he, he gave each and every one of us certain gifts and graces that we may function in our world and we may reach more and more people because of our differences. That's why he gave us those gifts. The problem was, as so many do, they abuse the gifts of God. And in chapter 12, Paul tells us what those gifts are, but he also tells us this, that we have neglected the gifts of God. We have neglected the things God has imparted to us. We have neglected and misused and abused the gifts that God has provided us for the purpose of kingdom building. That's the purpose of his gifts. That's the purpose of him sending his son. He didn't save us to save us because we're awesome. He saved us so that we could help in providing salvation to his creation which is awesome. That's some deadening science, silence. And I figured it would be because right now you're thinking of people that don't fit that category. How can you say that, Pastor, when there's this group of people and these people and those people and those individuals and that person? And how could you possibly say that? Well, I say that because... God's word says that and if God's word says it I take it as "Ooh, you guys are good man you guys are really good there today I take it as truth listen Paul addresses us neglecting our gifts and he does so by saying the problem and the reason we are abusing our gifts is because we do not bathe them in we do not reflect God's love in the midst of these gifts. Paul addresses the abuse of spiritual gifts, and then he tells us at the end, the last verse in chapter 12, now I will show you the most excellent way to exercise the gifts of God that are in Christ Jesus, and that is through these acts of love. Love that is the most excellent expression of God. Love that is boasted by Paul in these 13 verses of 1 Corinthians 13. Seven times Paul uses the word love, which translates to the word charity. The word charity, which is a benevolence to others, a kindness to others, caring for others. It is an attitude of service for others. This is why love has to be expressed in our giftings, in the things that we do that God has empowered us to do. Paul makes it clear in chapter 13 that God's love is imperative. You can't 
function without it. Listen to me, husbands, Valentine's week. If you want to love your wife, love God first. Wives, if you want to love that rascal sitting beside you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a male voice that was a male voice who was I talking to now the ladies right was I talking to the men yeah men then okay ladies love God first if you want love if you want to love love God first it's a very simple equation you will run into your people all your life, all throughout your life, that you seem, that seem impossible to love. And yes, you're probably right. There are people in all of our lives that are impossible to love, except through Christ Jesus, who gives us the strength to do the impossibles. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the very last verse, you know this, you've probably heard it many times, when all things are said and done and the end finally comes, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is because his love endures forever. His love is everlasting. His love is eternal. And if you're asking yourself, why is love more important than faith and hope? I'm not saying it's more important. I'm saying that it will, according to God's word, it will last. Think about it this way. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we're told that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And because faith fixes itself on the spiritual and assures us of an outcome, eternity. Whereas hope fastens itself to the future events and waits with certainty for the conclusion of the journey that we have in life. One day your faith will become sight and your Jesus you will see. Hope is the provisions that he provides for us to get to that day where faith becomes sight. Love is the instrument that carries us to that day and then on through eternity. Faith in heaven is not necessary. Jesus is there. He's before us. Hope in eternity is not necessary. But it is necessary to get us to that eternal day. Because Jesus, our hope, is with us in eternity. And his love, that perfect love that began this entire process, is a love that will carry us through on through eternity. We were saved by love. We were saved to love. And we were saved for the purpose of living love to others. Think about that. Think about it for just a moment. How love is eternal. How love is everlasting. So how does faith and hope operate in the now, today, while we are still physical beings, while we are still journeying through this life on earth? Well, number one is this. Faith was given by the Father for us as a tool. It is a tool that we use to overcome the things that we think we can't overcome to do what we think cannot be done to accomplish what we think we cannot accomplish how many things in your life have you thought about doing I mean wow I mean really thought about doing we're just having a world of trouble shut all that down I'm going to the handheld I think it's probably because I'm fat Test, test, test. Test, test. Can you hear me now? Excuse me. <laughs> I can actually hear myself. 
So faith here on earth was given to us by the Father as a tool. Remember this. Listen to Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is a gift from God. God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son. You know, the, you know how it goes, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But when he looked down, he realized that we were sheep. And he said, they're never going to find their way on their own. So I'm going to send them a shepherd, the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And not only am I going to send them a great shepherd, I'm going to give them the gift of believing in him. I'm going to give them the kind of faith that they're going to need to overcome in this world. That's why Jesus said, look to me, because I have overcome the world. And when we look to him, when we focus on him, when we connect with him, we too can be overcomers of whatever situation we may face. See, when faith is used in agreement with God for others, then we stand in the gap for others, as Ezekiel tells us, and we believe for those who struggle to believe. Have you ever been with somebody and you said, just, just have faith and believe God can? And they shake their head sadly. And they say, yeah, I get that. Have you ever been around somebody where you sometimes had to take them by the hand Stand with them and believe for them because they can't, because they're too weak to trust the faith they have, because too many things have went wrong in their life, and there's no way God is going to bless me this time. There's no way he's never done it before. You put your arm around their shoulders, or you take them by the hand, and you say, together we can. Together, we must trust in Jesus because there is no other way. See, Jesus said, when two of you agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father. Now, I want to read this again because I want you to hear this. Jesus said, when two of you agree on anything, it does not say when two believers agree upon everything. On anything it does not say when two believers come into agreement about anything it simply says when two of you agree upon anything ask for it and it will be done by the Heavenly Father notice anyone the word anyone here it doesn't specify whether you're a believer or not it doesn't specify the strength of your belief or how faithful you are to God, or how ruthless you've been in this life. It's about coming to agreement together. How in the world could you have been saved if you didn't come into agreement, lack your faith of belief at the time you prayed the prayer? This is not a prerequisite. It's just merely a fact, a truth, where two come together and agree upon anything. The second thing we notice here is, is the word hope. Hope was promised by the Father. So he says to us, choose. Choose hope. Choose not. Choose to live in a hope that knowing that tomorrow will come even if there is no tomorrow. And that life will come even if your life ends before tomorrow. See, we have that right to choose. It is our choice. We either choose Jesus, choose life, or as Deuteronomy says, choose the world and choose death. But it's up to you. Choose life or choose death. It is totally up to you. And the thing I love most about these passages today is, is I recognize this. Now, now, I want you to listen close today because I think this is very important going forward. In our world today, this is, this is as imperative as the love of God that is at work within us. When I or when you or when we choose Jesus and we accept him and we exercise our faith through him and we have a hope because of him, 
He then directs our paths. He directs our paths. A lot of times we think we choose the path. Most of the time we choose a path, as Proverbs says, it ends in destruction. But when we accept Jesus, he then directs our paths, and he directs them to others. Get this. Others loosely translated is the word neighbors. Love your neighbors as yourself, as Matthew tells us in 2237. This word neighbors in the original text is pleasant. And it simply means creation. Creation. When God says, love your neighbors as yourself, when God says, play on, he is talking about absolutely everyone you will encounter in this journey called life. You don't get to pick and you don't get to choose who crosses your path. Have you ever noticed, I've always found this interesting, I mean, serious. There are some people that I, I pray our paths never cross. Anyone else? Oh, come on, five hands. Give me a break. That should have been a click. There's some in here I don't want to cross paths. No, I'm just kidding. All of us know that there are people that we pray. It, it, Lord, at work today, I hope and pray I never see this person. Lord, I know we've been friends for a long time, but I pray we never cross paths today. Father, I've loved my spouse for a long time, but today, I can't do it. I can't do it. Now, how many have been in one of those categories? Okay, I'm just checking to see who's lying in here today. That's all I'm doing. I'll talk about lying next week in my, in my, in my message. Listen to me. When God says, plays on. When he's talking about neighbors, he's talking about all creation. We don't choose our neighbors. We don't choose who we are going to encounter each and every day. And we, that's you and I, won't choose who we go to. Have you ever noticed, and that's what I was getting ready to talk about, have you ever noticed that there are certain people that cross your paths all the time? Have you ever noticed that? And people that you like and people that you don't like. It's the ones that you don't like I want to focus on. Because the reason they're crossing your path is because God wants you to do something about this thing within you that you don't like. Please hear this. This work of God's love in us is not about changing them. It's about changing you. It seems like the people that I try to avoid, I see all the time. The people that I want to see all the time, it's like I never see them. Don't you think that it stands the reason that there's a plan within that? That there's something that the Lord is trying to do, he's trying to say to us? You don't get to choose your neighbor. You don't get to choose whose path you cross. And you don't get to choose if you have the love of God that is in Christ Jesus in you, in love, in the things you say, in the thoughts that you think, in the actions that you perform. You don't get to choose. He directs your path. And I know sitting here right now, I, I know some of you are thinking right now, man, every time I go into Walmart, I run into that person. Well, this is a great week to say happy Valentine's Day. Someone's trying to get a cupcake. March 1st is coming around. Birthdays. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love, bless all as yourself. That's the word. Love everyone. Love anyone who crosses your path. 
And if you think you can do that without the strength of Jesus in you, God bless you. You're, you're the nearest thing to Jesus that I've ever met. He knows we need his help. So how is hope used in agreement with God? Jeremiah says, for he knows the plans he has made for us. He has plans that will prosper us and not harm us. Plans to give us hope and a future. And this hope is not just for us, but it's for anyone who would seek. It goes on to say in 12 through 14, So if you call upon the Lord and come and pray to him, he will listen to you. And you will seek him and find him when you seek him with all of your heart. He says, I will be found by you, I promise. I will be found by you if you come and ask me to be a part of your life and ask me to be a part of the words that you say, the thoughts that you think, and the expressions that you live by. And once we are found, declares the Lord, he will bring us back from captivity, the captivity that the world has placed upon us. The world would love to keep you in bondage the world would love to keep you under their thumb. The world and the powers to be, they want the authority over you. We have one authority. And I love it when people say, oh, did you see what the Democrats did? Did you see what the liberals are doing? Did you notice what the Republicans aren't doing? And what about the conservatives? Hey, I don't care what any of them are doing. I really, really don't. Because I am a firm believer that God knows the plans he has made for Dave West. Plans not to harm me, but to give me hope and a future, regardless of what they say, regardless of the policies and procedures that they put in place. Stop worrying about the things you can't control and start embracing the things that God has given us to control us. Of course, all the political people right now just went... I know I've told you this before, but I always I get the biggest kick out of this. When I was little, I wanted to be a trash man. Oh, I'm sorry, a trash person. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to swing off the back of a truck, grab a hold of a can, ugh, dump it. That looked like the coolest job in the world. Then as I got a little older, Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I wanted to be a politician. I had my heart. I had my heart set on being going into politics. And um, hallelujah, I was redeemed. So what do I end up doing? I end up doing creating policies to take the trash out as a pastor the sins of our life. It's always interesting when you look back and see what God has done with your life and, and what he has led you to. And so I ask you today, if God is leading us into a future, who is he leading you to today? Maybe the person that you keep crossing paths with. It's easy to love those who love us. It's easy to embrace those who are willing to embrace us but what about the ones that aren't what about the ones that you don't love are you willing I hate to ask this question I'm going to ask it anyways are you willing to stand there at the gates one day and watch anyone go to an eternal hell I'm not at least not on my watch, not in my time. As our praise and worship band comes back to the platform, and Lord knows what's going to happen at this point, this is where you put your trust in him and you believe in your brothers and sisters to carry us through. 
See, when faith and hope work together in agreement with God, now please hear this. This is what Paul's writing about in chapter 13, verse 13. The result is true love. The result is a true, perfected love. When faith and hope work together in agreement with God, the result is a true love that is now able to live out loud and live outwardly for the sake of others. Faith is a gift of God to go and do what he would do. Hope is a provision of God to stand in the gap until that time. And love, according to the word of God, is always the proof of God. No one has ever seen God, John says in 1 John 4, 12. But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made, listen to this, his love is made complete. Not lacking anything. You can't be complete if you're lacking something. He says, then my love is made complete in you. And all of a sudden you'll notice the words that you say change. The thoughts that you once thought you don't think anymore and your actions they speak of something else that's in control of your life that isn't me, myself and I see with with courage With the right kind of courage, we can live love to the world, to the unknowns. So my question today is this. Are you courageous enough to hear the voice of God today through his word, to learn from his word, and to let go? the words of your life and the words of the world. To do so will take courage. That's what Paul was calling for. Valor. You know, I'm sitting here, Brent's sitting right here, and as I talk about valor, as I talk about courage, I think of young men like Brent, the men and women over our military who love you so much, love our country so much, regardless of who it is, regardless of where they've come from or what they've done, that they're willing to put their love where their mouth is. And they said, I do. And they went in. And they gave their lives for us. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Would that be you today? Would you heed the call of Paul today, God's word in 1 Corinthians 13? Would you begin the process today of maybe maybe taking that one thing out of your life, that one person that you hope and pray you never cross paths with, that one person and surrender that person to God today? So here's your question. Is there anyone in your life, do you have one person, more than one, is there anyone in your life today that you wish and pray and hope that you'd never cross paths with? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Don't be looking around. It is amazing. In a moment, we're going to sing this song, and hopefully it's going to come up on the board. But even if it does, we're going to sing it. And as we sing it, I want you to think about that person you raised your hand for. I want you to think about them people. Maybe you didn't raise your hand because you're thinking there's too many of them. I want you to think about them this morning. I want you to think about what it would be like to stand at the gates and see them go to another place. And ask yourself this question. Why did God bring them into my life? And the answer is simple. Because he is calling you to do something for them that he has called nobody else to do. 
So as you stand to your feet,